Hello, passengers of Flight 17 bound for Caracas. With stops in Atlanta and Miami, the departure gate has been changed to 30B. Also, there will be a slight departure delay due to inclement weather outside. The ground crew is in the process of de-icing the wings in preparation for departure. It also looks like the flight is slightly overbooked, so we are offering complimentary round-trip tickets to a few passengers who are willing to take a later flight. We should be boarding about a quarter to the hour. Thank you for your patience. I once had a friend that was diagnosed with terminal cancer and the news that he might only live up to six months was a great shock to him, his family, and his friends. However, in spite of the dire prognosis, he was initially determined to look into all available treatments that might cure or extend his life. I think that when you find yourself in such situations, you tend to look up every possible avenue for hope of preserving your life. As the months progressed and his health grew worse, I noticed an unexpected change in his attitude that came over him. He had always been a jovial person with an upbeat personality, but rather give in to discouragement and self-pity, he took comfort in his faith in God and humanity. His conversations focused on others rather than himself, and he spoke of the afterlife as something he was prepared for believing that his deceased ancestors, including his mother and father, were there waiting for him. During the last few months, weeks, and days of his life, he was kindly cared for by family, friends, and his loving wife, who looked after both his physical and emotional needs, and workers from a local hospice came to the home to help regulate his medication and provide any other needed support. He didn't complain about his fate, and he was willing to allow others to serve him, realizing that they were the benefactors of something more. Indeed, one might ponder why God allows death and suffering in our world, but for me, such experiences taught me to value family more and kindness for others. You often can't learn these important attributes in the lap of luxury, and perhaps such an experience is the greatest and final gift the terminally ill can give those left behind. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a thrilling game at the Tokyo Dome with the U.S. team taking a drumming at the hands of the Japanese national team going into the second half, 51-26. to The U.S. Dream Team is made up of NBA veterans, supposedly the best we have to offer, but they need a miracle to dig themselves out of a hole and come back at this point. Unfortunately for the Dream Team, their leading scorer, High Fly Wilson was ejected one minute into the second quarter after climbing into the stands and fighting with a spectator who had continually heckled Wilson for shooting three air balls in a row. Another bizarre moment came late in the second quarter when the Japanese center Tomohiro Suzuki suffered a concussion and was knocked out cold as he lunged for a ball and collided with the knee of one of his own teammates. There also have been several other injuries, including the loss of starting forward Masa Harara. Some of the coaches on the U.S. team are attributing the team's sluggish performance to some raw fish they had last night while attending a banquet in their honor. Next thing we'll know it, they'll be blaming their players' cement hands on a demonstration class on Japanese paper folding earlier this week. Who knows what'll be next? Okay, it looks like we're ready for the second half. our new show, Exotic Animal Kingdom, a program geared toward introducing animals to the young and old. In today's show, our young but experienced guest will introduce us to the fantastic world of bearded dragons, 
Welcome, Joshua. Thank you very much. Now, Joshua, I must admit that a bearded dragon sounds something like out of a fantasy book. What exactly is a bearded dragon? Well, here, why don't you hold on to Bert? Whoa, he's... <laughs> wow, okay. While I talk about him. Okay. Bearded dragons actually originated from the deserts of Australia, mm -hmm. and this is one of the several species that survived in that climate. Today, beauties like this one are bred in captivity here in the U.S., Okay, and so what are some of the essential things to know when getting a bearded dragon? I mean, can you raise one as a family pet? Bearded dragons make a great family pet and are very docile creatures. Yeah, this one seems quite friendly. You just need to know how to care for them. Well, what are some of the things that you should keep in mind? First, you need to have the right supplies, some kind of enclosure. Like a, like a cage or something. Have you been in an accident and still haven't received the financial settlement you deserve? Then call the professionals of Lawsuit Financing today. With over 75 years of combined experience, we have settled millions of dollars in claims with all types of cases. Medical malpractice, personal injury, wrongful death, motor vehicle accidents, and employment discrimination. What's more, we can provide you with the cash to take care of your immediate financial needs. Home mortgages, car payments, and bills. No credit checks or application fees, and you can be approved within 24 hours. And you don't pay anything until we win your case, and you keep the cash advance if we don't. So why wait? The other guy has lawyers working harder on their cases, so why shouldn't you? Call now for a free over-the-phone consultation to assess your case. You have nothing to lose. I love trees. I love trees because they are an important commodity to the environment. They make life possible on this planet, along with other plants. I also love the trees' glorious display of colors in the fall. I love trees because they have many different shades of green, so many that it's almost impossible to count. When I paint a picture of a tree, I use many shades of green and many more shades of brown. My favorite thing about trees is that they always seem to have a glow around them. I love trees because they always smell so fresh and clean. I like to go to the nursery because I love the smell of trees. It's so refreshing. It's a glass of cool water on a hot day, or a damp cloth on a hot forehead. I love to plant trees. I love to dig through the soil and make a hole in which the tree will rest. I love to place the tree in the ground, making sure not to disturb the roots, which will be the tree's support. I love to water the trees. I love to pour the water on the trees, knowing that it would grow. One of my favorite things about trees is that they are fun to climb. I started climbing trees when I was little. My dad taught me how to climb, along with some useful tips. I especially like to climb my grandpa's apple tree. I love to wind through the branches and climb to a board that has been placed there. Once up, I like to think and relax, or bring a book up with me. It's fun to let my imagination run away with me while munching apples. I love trees in the autumn when they display their beautiful colors. In the autumn time, splashes of red, yellow, orange, and green decorate the mountainside. The maples go red, the oak and aspen go yellow, while the evergreens maintain their beautiful shade of green. Well, for those of you who went out today, I don't have to tell you it was clear but muggy for most of the state with the high temperatures and the low to mid-90s. The city of Elkview had the high for the day of 97 degrees, and that's hot. I'm glad I'm working indoors today. For those of you planning outdoor activities tomorrow, you can expect fair skies for most of Saturday with temperatures in the high 90s. However, things might change by Saturday evening with a storm front moving in. We can expect light scattered showers over the northern part of the state, bringing slightly cooler temperatures in the 80s, but this rain should taper off by mid-Sunday morning. It will be partly cloudy for most of the morning, 
but these clouds should move out by mid-afternoon. Sky should be clear Sunday night for those wanting to catch a glimpse of the partial lunar eclipse. It should start at 1047. And that's all for today's weather. For many homeowners, refinancing their home mortgages can provide numerous financial benefits over the long run. For one, you can lower your monthly mortgage payments by taking advantage of lower interest rates. This amount can be significant depending on the market rates. Second, reducing your mortgage can provide you with additional funds to finance other home improvements like repairing that leaky roof, adding a garage, or building an addition onto your home. Furthermore, by refinancing, you can greatly reduce the length of your loan. After several years into your mortgage, people often earn more money than when they first purchased their home and thus have a surplus to pay off loans quicker. However, for some people, refinancing their mortgages just makes sense providing a cushion in case of a financial crisis due to loss of employment or a medical crisis. Whatever you do, be sure to gather all the facts about refinancing to make the best informed decision that will meet your current and future needs. Welcome to Space Radio Theater, your passport to the future. In this episode, the crew is under attack by an unknown source until it is too late. This episode opens with the crew members on board the Starship Quest. Status, Commander Cordovi. Course looks clear, Cap. Yes, Commander. The captain suddenly realizes that Mr. Cordovi has disappeared from the bridge. Commander? Computer. Locate Commander Cordovi. Mr. Cordovi is not aboard this ship. Computer. What was the status of the ship from one minute prior to his leaving the ship to one minute after he left? Unknown aliens connected with ship systems. The aliens sent an electric charge through transporter system. Bridge to transporter room. Lieutenant, please respond. Security. Report to the transporter room immediately and investigate. Security officers Lieutenant Mortia Adams and Ensign Greg Suzuki ran down the corridors to the transporter room. Now, we take you to the transporter room. Mortia, look at this! I'd like to share with you a remarkable Christmas story, one of courage, life, and love. 25 years ago, Ray Anderson, a single parent with a one-year-old son, was returning home after running a few errands Christmas Eve when he witnessed a horrendous accident which took place when the driver of a truck ran a red light and collided with the car of Sandra Jenkins. The impact of the collision killed Sandra instantly, but her three-month-old daughter was left trapped upside down in the burning wreckage seemingly doomed to a fiery tomb. While others looked on in horror, Anderson jumped out of his vehicle and crawled into the car through the shattered rear window to try to free the infant. Seconds later, the car was totally engulfed in flames, but Anderson was miraculously able to pull the baby to safety. While the child came out of the accident virtually unscathed, Anderson suffered third-degree burns over 80% of his body. Two days later, Anderson died but his heroic act was published widely in the media. Then, Anderson's son was soon adopted by a relative and the family moved to the East Coast. The most remarkable part of this story unfolded only last week. Karen and her fiancé Aaron 
were looking through some old boxes in the attic of Karen's home when they came across some old newspaper clippings. On one summer weekend, my wife, son, and I entered an eight-kilometer running race at a place called Provo Canyon in Utah. Now, most people think of running races on neighborhood streets, uh, city streets. But in this race, participants ran on mountain trails in which you have to climb and descend parts of the course. Now, when the race started, my son took off quickly, but my wife and I started and stayed back and ran together. At times we ran, in some parts we walked because the hills were steep. Now, we're not very competitive, so we just enjoyed talking together and enjoying the scenery. Now, during the last part of the race, as I descended a narrow rocky trail behind my wife, I tripped on a rock or tree root, I don't remember, and I had a spectacular fall. And in the process, I jammed my toe pretty hard. I quickly got back up and started again, only to trip again. Now, I realized I had injured my toe, but I wasn't going to take the time to take off my shoe and sock to check the damage. Instead, we kept running, and I was feeling pretty good about our time. Arches National Park is located in the dry desert of southeastern Utah, just north of the city of Moab. This park is home to over 2,000 natural arches, carved from sandstone layers by wind, water, and erosion. Local and international visitors can enjoy breathtaking views of these natural wonders throughout the year. Some formations are just off the road and are accessible to all people within a short distance on well-traveled trails. Other arches can only be reached by driving distances on four-wheel drive roads, or after long, strenuous hikes along sandy washes. Like any hike of this nature, you should be prepared for the adventure in the desert. First, hike with a partner for safety and leave word where you will be traveling in case of an emergency. Personally, I enjoy hiking with family members and close friends. Second, carry a cell phone with you. However, keep in mind that you might not get any reception, so don't depend on it. Third, be sure to have the right clothing and footwear for the hike. Light, breathable clothing is best during the summer, along with a hat and sturdy hiking shoes. So, do you want to be a hero today? Well, there is a great need for blood donations around the world and you can be the means of saving lives. According to the American Red Cross, over 40,000 blood donations are needed every single day in the United States alone. And without the help of volunteers like you, it is impossible to fill this need. About 9.2 million people donate every year in the U.S. And although approximately 38% of the population is eligible to donate, less than 10% of them actually do. Sometimes people don't donate out of fear, but the process is relatively simple, following a four-step process. Registering, getting your medical history checked, donating, and then having some refreshments. And once you donate, you have the ability to donate red blood cells every 56 days. So carefully consider becoming a hero today. Donate blood and you can save lives. Oh, Mrs. Smith, uh, can I take the test now? Just, oh. Excuse me? What do you mean? The test ended ten minutes ago, and you weren't there to take it. Sorry. Oh, Mrs. Smith, come on. Come on. That's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? Everybody else was there. Why weren't you in class? Uh, 
My bus didn't come this morning on time. That's why. Um, are you sure? Well, yeah. Your friend Tony made it to class and he uh, said you were still in bed an hour ago. Uh, yeah, well, that might be true, but I really need to take the test. Wait, don't you realize you just lied to me? <laughs> well, well, listen, Mrs. Smith, listen. My alarm didn't go off this morning, so it's not my fault I came late. You're blaming your alarm clock again? <laughs> It's still your responsibility to be here. Wasn't that your excuse the last two times you missed class? Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Smith. Listen, you know the policy of our program. Hi, Faith. Do you have a minute? Sure. What's up? Well, I just wanted to go over the schedule for Wednesday's orientation meeting to make sure everything is ready. Okay. Here's a copy of the tentative schedule. Okay. Now, the registration starts at 8.30 and right. goes until 9.15. All right. Then the orientation meeting will commence at 9.30. Okay. Now, we had planned originally for the meeting to go until 10.30. But now we have someone from the International Center coming to speak to the students on extracurricular activities. So how about ending the meeting around 11? Fine. And uh, then students will take the placement test from 11.15 until noon. Okay. Followed by a 20-minute break before lunch. Okay. And immediately after lunch, we have reserved a campus shuttle to give students a 45-minute tour starting at 1.30. Oh, okay. We want to show students around the university, including the Union Building, the Library, and the Student Services Building. Great. Now, how about the oral interviews? Well, we're planning to start them at 2.15. Oh, well, teachers are going to be up to their ears in preparations. Okay, let's begin. Hello, everyone. My name's Carl Roberts, and I'll be your teacher for this class, Intercultural Communication 311. To begin with, uh, please look at the syllabus in front of you. You should all have one by now, I think. Um, this class meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 315 to 450. We will be meeting in this room for the first half of the course, but we will be using the research lab every other week on Thursday in room 405 during the last two months of the class. Uh, this is the text for the class, Beyond Language. Unfortunately, the books haven't come in yet, but I was told that you should be able to buy them at the bookstore. of waiting for a web page to download? Then sign up for the hottest broadband highway to the internet from Impact Solutions. We provide you with unlimited monthly access, 24-7 technical support, 30 megabytes of free web space for your personal or business site, and content filters to protect your family from objectionable material. Pricing starts at $29.95 a month. And with no setup fees, you'll be roaring through the corridors of cyberspace. Well, in time for when you really should be asleep. Contact Impact Solutions today to get the most out of your online experience. Today I'm interviewing nine-year-old Alex about her feelings and how people can help save the environment. So Alex, how can we save the environment? By saving water. Well, how can we do that? By not using too much water when we wash dishes, take a bath, and when we do other things like watering the plants outside. Oh, I think I can do that. What else? When drinking or eating something outside, you should keep the garbage until you find the trash can to put it in, because littering makes our planet dirty. Do you like seeing trash all over the ground? No, I don't. Do you have any final suggestions? Yes, we shouldn't waste paper because trees are being cut down to make the paper. By recycling paper, we save the forest where animals live. So how can children recycle paper? I mean, every day. Well, for example, 
When I was in kindergarten, I used to save the newspapers so that I could make things out of them, like paper trees, instead of just throwing them away. Now the children in our neighborhood collect newspapers once a month to take them to our recycling center. That's great. Well, thanks, Alex, for your ideas. Hello, everyone. Have you ever wondered what the weather is like in other places around the world? Today, I'd like to talk to you about the changing seasons in my city, which was the assigned topic for this class. First of all, the winter season usually begins in December and ends in early March. The coldest month is January, and the temperatures can drop below freezing for most of this month. The city usually averages about 30 inches of snow during this entire three-month period. Occasionally, we have snowstorms that can drop a foot of snow in a very short period of time. Winter activities during the season include sledding, skiing, and snowshoeing. Spring usually arrives in late March, and the temperatures hover around 50 degrees during the day. It is a beautiful season because the flowers start to bloom. It is also sometimes windy, and this is great for flying kites. People in my city often like to go on picnics, stroll through the parks, and play outdoor games. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Craig Stone, and I'll be your guide for today's tour of Kyoto. First, I want to go over the itinerary for the tour, so everyone can enjoy the trip without being worried about being left behind along the way, and no one has gotten lost so far. First of all, we'll be leaving at 9:15 outside the main train station exit. That's in 30 minutes. Be sure to board the bus by 9 o'clock sharp. We'll be visiting some of the most famous historical spots in Kyoto. Our first stop will be at the Golden Pavilion, a temple constructed in 1397. We'll be leaving there at 10:30. You'll have about 45 minutes to stroll around the temple and its gardens. Our next destination will be the Ryuanji Temple. That's always a difficult one to pronounce. This temple is famous for its beautiful rock garden. We'll depart from the temple at 11:45. Next, we'll have lunch from 12 to 12:45. In the afternoon, we'll be making a brief stop at Heian Jingu Shrine, which was constructed in 1895 to commemorate the 1,100th anniversary of the founding of the city of Kyoto. After that, we'll head downtown and stop in Gion. Many people ask me about different traditional shopping areas, and this is a place that we don't want to miss. You'll have about an hour to look around. And I'm sure you'll enjoy the atmosphere of the entire area—the shops, the homes, and the restaurants. A very traditional flavor of Kyoto. We'll be leaving Gion at 2:30. Finally, we'll visit Ninjojo Castle, which was the residence of the first Tokugawa shogun. You'll have about an hour to tour the castle, and we'll meet at the bus at 4 o'clock. Any questions? Ladies and gentlemen, our country has come to a crossroad, and now you have the power to change the political landscape of America. As I have said time and time again, if you elect me to be your face in Congress, there are several things I will do to ensure that your needs are met day in and day out across this land. First of all, I plan on proposing new legislation that will invest more tax dollars in our public schools. Not only to meet the needs of today, but to encourage developing minds for the future. Such new funding would be used to hire and retain good teachers, build and renovate new schools, and give great tax breaks to classroom teachers. To accomplish this, I'm proposing no new tax increases, but rather a rechanneling of our existing tax revenue to meet these demands. Now the incumbent and his staff have been talking about this for years with little progress. I plan to change all of this now. Second, economic development is on the minds of most of you, particularly with regard to our downtown area. For many years, economic prosperity has been neglected by current government leaders, and I plan to change all of that. 
I'm proposing a new city center revitalization project. Hello and welcome to the University Library. This tape tour will introduce you to our library facilities and operating hours. First of all, the library's collection of books, reference materials, and other resources are found on levels 1 to 4 in this building. Level 1 houses our humanities and map collections. On level 2, you will find our circulation desk, current periodicals and journals, and our copy facilities. Our science and engineering sections can be found on level 3. You can also find back issues of periodicals and journals older than six months on this level. Finally, group study rooms, our microfilm collection, and the multimedia center are located on level four. Undergraduate students can check out up to five books for two weeks. Graduate students can check out 15 books for two months. We interrupt our regular scheduled news program to bring you live up-to-date coverage on the civil unrest in the newly formed country of Karnak, where our man Stan Fielding is stationed. Stan? This is Stan Fielding, report reporting live from the outskirts of the capital city. Just 20 minutes ago, rebel forces launched the biggest offensive against the ruling government in the 18-month conflict here in this country. Now, Stan, is this a sign that the peace process has been totally abandoned? Well, Bob, so far, peace negotiations have failed, and any resolution to quell the civil war appears bleak at this point. As you can see... Whoa! Stan? Stan, are you there? Uh, yes, Bob. As you can probably hear behind me, rebel forces are also using heavy artillery to pound government strongholds around the city center. Rebel forces are closing in, and it's feared that they will be able to take the Capitol building before sunup, where it is believed many government officials are holding out. Now, besides the heavy fighting, what other pressing concerns are there for the citizens of the city? Well, since the beginning of the conflict, starvation, clean water, and adequate shelter have been the biggest daily obstacles facing the citizens of this torn country. Hello, this is Greg Rice reporting for TBC News in blizzard conditions in the freezing state of Alaska. I've just arrived in Barrow, Alaska to bring you live coverage of what appears to be the results of a huge meteorite impact, perhaps the largest in recent history that occurred just 12 hours ago. The exact location of the impact is unknown, but estimates put it about 20 kilometers south of Barrow based on shock waves felt throughout the region. Some witnesses say they saw a bright light streaking through the sky, accompanied by a roaring boom moments before the impact. It's unknown whether there are any casualties, but it's unlikely considering this sparsely populated area. Such impacts were commonplace during the formation of our solar system, and many believe that a meteorite 10 kilometers in diameter crashed into Earth 65 million years ago, which led to the mass extinction of many animal species, including the dinosaurs. It's often difficult to calculate the number of such large impacts on Earth because a On December 25th, 2000, many people across North America received a rare Christmas treat when the moon passed in front of the sun, resulting in a partial solar eclipse. Solar eclipses occur when the moon passes between the earth and the sun, and the moon's shadow covers part of the earth, and a total solar eclipse takes place when the moon's shadow blocks out the sun entirely. What made this particular solar eclipse unique 
was that this event has occurred on December 25th only 30 times during the past 5,000 years, the last time in 1954. But people must be exceptionally careful when attempting to view a solar eclipse. Without taking precautionary measures, one can permanently damage the retina of the eye. However, there are several safe methods of witnessing this heavenly marvel. First, you can view a solar eclipse by using eclipse safety glasses for filtering out the sun's harmful rays. They should be used when any part of the sun is visible. Sunglasses can block out some of the sun's ultraviolet rays, but the results can be very deceptive. The eye's natural reaction to this darkened state when wearing sunglasses is to make the pupil larger. Days. Recycle newspapers and save a tree. Collect bottles and cans so they can be reused in the manufacturing of new products. Protecting our delicate environment seems to be on the agenda of politicians, government leaders, and citizens in many parts of the world to show support for Mother Nature. The concept of green consumerism has gained momentum more and more over the last decade, and the public feels moved to pitch in and help. However, three essential keys need to power this movement include a more informed public, the development of improved technology, and a greater demand for recycled materials. The first step is to raise public awareness about the recycling process, to explain the kinds of materials that can be recycled, and provide ways on how to properly dispose of them. Local governments should educate the public on how to properly sort reusable materials from those like wax paper, carbon paper, plastic laminated materials such as fast food wrappers that can't be recycled very easily. Then a system of collecting these sorted materials needs to be established. The public interest might be there, but soon may wane if there isn't a system where they can take these materials to be recycled. Surgical procedures. Cosmetic or plastic surgery often evokes images of famous personalities wanting to alter their appearances through elective surgical procedures. However, Reconstructive surgery is a procedure that makes a similar but different impact on the lives of many around the world, and many of these patients suffer from either congenital defects, like a cleft palate, or from injuries sustained in accidents or as a result of animal bites. Some disfigurements can also be due to the effects of disease or infection, yet the individual with such defects often bears more than just outward physical marks. Loss of hope and self-worth, as well as acceptance, are commonplace. In the past, such procedures were only available in developed countries where the medical expertise and financial resources were available to afford such operations. Here are the top stories today. A giant crocodile attacked a man walking his dog along a river in Australia. Fortunately, the man beats the beast back with a rock as the man's dog bites the reptile on the face. Both man and dog suffered minor injuries but are expected to recover. Next, a huge tornado catches a woman trapped in her vehicle and carries her a quarter of a mile from town. The woman suffered a broken leg and minor neck injuries, but she was more worried about her cat swept away by the storm. She's offering a $1,000 reward for her feline friend. In another part of the world, a man gets his hand stuck in a kitchen garbage disposal and is trapped for three days. His cries went unanswered until breaking the kitchen window and signaling for help with a fire extinguisher. 
The man said that his wedding ring disappeared down the disposal and he was trying to fish it out. And finally, a Canadian family of four gets lost trying to drive across a mountain pass in a blizzard and is stranded for a week, surviving on a banana, tin cheese crackers, and a cook can. Temperatures dip to 15 below as the family stays warm by singing Christmas carols. The family is finally rescued after the father hikes 15 miles to get help. And that's the news today. This is Sky Cam from Channel 11 News reporting to you live over the valley. For those of you heading south on I-15 on your commute home from work, expect some delays around the 215 interchange. Road crews are making repairs on the left lane, so commuters should be prepared to shift over to the right around 7200 south. This bottleneck appears to clear up around 9600 south. You should expect such delays at least until the end of the week. Northbound I-15 looks good until you reach around 3300 south. Minor fender bender, perhaps resulting from poor visibility out there, has traffic backed up a mile or so. Also, some reports have come in on patches of black ice on roads in that area. Forecasters predict sporadic freezing rain later into the night and early morning hours. And one more note, frigid temperatures and heavy snow in the mountains have forced a herd of elk down into Riverside Park. So extreme caution should be taken if you're traveling around that area. And that's all from Sky Cam 11, providing you with traffic updates on the hour. Hello everyone, and welcome to our show, Families in Transition. We'd also like to welcome our guest today, Dr. Philip Monroe, Director of the Family Relations Center here in our city. He is also the author of the book, Rearing Children for Success from the Front Lines. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here on your program today. So first of all, what inspired you to write your book, and what is it all about? Well, it's often said that becoming a parent is one job you can land without experience or credentials, and that is really true. I guess you could say that through trial and error and a number of mistakes, I realized that I personally needed to figure out how to become a better parent, too, I mean, for myself. And before I got married, I had read numerous books on child rearing and child psychology to try to prepare myself for this transitional phase in my own life. But every family and situation is so unique, and the challenges of raising children are often so complex that not one guidebook can fully prepare you for what awaits you on the front lines. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, doctor, how many children do you have? We have five. Really? That's, yeah. that's quite a lot. Well, yeah, and they're all unique, and there's never a dull moment around our house. I bet there's... Professor of Sociology. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today's plenary address, Dr. Howard Miller. Dr. Miller, Professor of Sociology at Washington University, has written numerous articles and books on the issues facing older Americans in our graying society for the past 15 years. Dr. Miller? Thank you for that introduction. Today I'd like to preface my remarks from a story from my own life, which I feel highlights our common concerns that bring us here together. Several years ago, when my grandparents were well into their 80s, they were faced with the reality of no longer being able to adequately care for themselves. My grandfather spoke of his greatest fear, that of leaving the only home they had known for the past 60 years. Fighting back the tears, he spoke proudly of the fact that he had built their home from the ground up and that he had pounded every nail and laid every brick in the process. The prospect of having to sell their home and give up their independence and move into a retirement home was an extremely traumatic experience for them. It was, in my grandfather's own words, like having a limb severed off. He was quite emphatic, exclaiming that he felt he wasn't important anymore. For them and some older Americans, their so-called golden years are at times not so pleasant, 
for this period can mean the decline of not only one's health, but the loss of identity and self-worth. In many societies, this self-identity is closely related with our social status, occupation, material possessions, or independence. Furthermore, we often live in societies that value that which is new or in vogue, and our own usage of lexicon in the English language often does not bode well for older Americans. I mean Good evening, and welcome to tonight's program. Our guest is the world-known Dr. Charles Adams, who has sparked a great deal of attention over the past several years for his research in the area of language learning. His new book, Learning a Language Over Eggs and Toast, has been on the bestseller list for the past six weeks. Welcome to our program. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, Dr. Adams, tell us about the title of your book, Learning a Language Over Eggs and Toast. Well, one of the most important keys to learning another language is to establish a regular study program, like planning a few minutes every morning around breakfast time. Now, sorry for saying this, but your ideas may sound a little simplistic <laughs> to our viewers. I mean, I took Spanish in high school for four years, and I didn't become a proficient speaker of the language. Well, I think there are many people that feel that way, and that's just it. I'm not implying that we can become fluent speakers in a matter of a few minutes here and there, mm -hmm. but rather following a regular, consistent, and focused course of study can help us on the way to the promised land of language mastery. And remember, there is a difference between native fluency and proficiency in the language, and I'm proposing the latter. So what are some of the basic keys you are suggesting in your book? Well, as I just mentioned, people need to plan out their study by setting realistic and attainable goals from the beginning. Okay. I mean, some people get caught up in the craze of learning a language in 30 days only to become disenchanted when they don't perform up to their expectations. Mm 